Hi. Hi. Happy New Year, beautiful girls. <laughs> Thank you. You as well. Um, I have to say, I've interviewed some amazing people, but I have bubbles on the inside. I'm so excited to meet the both of you. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to meet you as well. And obviously, I've never met Monica, but it's so fantastic to meet you. I watch your whole presentation from New York, actually. So. Wow. Thank you so much. Congratulations on being Thank Time's you. first kid of the year. That's amazing. You're such an inspiration. Well, yeah, congratulations on Young Scientist Challenge. I mean, <laughs> obviously, you're going you're gonna to have so much fun over these next couple of years. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, you know what? Let's just start. I'm going to record. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Everything I want to talk to you about, I'm just going to do it on air. Yeah? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Three, two, one. Hello universe, it's finally 2021 with the year that we've had and also just the few days we've already experienced in 2021. I think all of us could use a huge dose of optimism and hope. I could think of no better guests than the ones I have today. I'm calling this episode Super Kids because that's who we have, two amazing young ladies who are super inspiring. Meet 15-year-old Gitanjali Rao and 14-year-old Anika Chebrolu. Gitanjali is a high school sophomore from Colorado. You may have heard of her or even seen her because she was selected as Time Magazine's first ever Kid of the Year and featured right smack dab on the front cover. Gitanjali has been celebrated for her work using technology to tackle issues ranging from contaminated drinking water to cyberbullying. And meet Anika, a high school freshman from Texas who won the 2020 3M Young Scientist of the Year Challenge. As the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies race to find treatments for the novel coronavirus, Anika has been working for months on a potential treatment in her bedroom and her groundbreaking discovery could lead to a cure for COVID-19. So first of all, hi ladies. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Can I just say, it's like an honor and a privilege to have you both on my show and to meet the both of you. And I just wanna say hello. I have like, I was saying this before we started. I feel like I have bubbles meeting the both of you. I'm so excited. Um, I know the two of you haven't met. Um, so I was super excited to make that happen too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, thanks for this opportunity. I. I feel like we would have, obviously our paths would have crossed because our all of our goals and stuff aligned. But um, yeah, thanks for making this happen super fast. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for making oh, this happen. Oh, please. It's Don't so even... amazing to meet Gitanjali and like really get to know her right now. Because yeah, if we would have obviously met sooner or later, but it's really nice to meet her now. Um. So first of all, where are you both Zooming from? I'm Zooming from my mom's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm zooming from the downstairs office in Denver, Colorado. Ah, uh, and then um, Anika, are you, you're in Texas, right? Let's go Texas. Yes. Um, okay. So both of you have been thrusted into the public eye. You both are famous. People of all ages, walks of lives all over the world are so inspired of you, but also proud. Um, how has your life changed? since you guys got this platform and spotlight. Yeah. Anika, I, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Let Anika go. <laughs> Personally, uh, my life has changed a lot. Um, it's really amazing to get so much support and motivation from people that I've never met before. And it's really just like awe inspiring to see other kids as well, just step up and use their um, amazing talents and intelligence to change the places and problems in the world. Like Ethanjali, um, and so many other children and people. Yeah, and then kind of basically bouncing off of that, um, about four years ago for the platform that Discovery Education and 3M set up for me as well. Um, since then, it's obviously increased and the people I've reached out to have increased as well. And it's changed only in positive ways, knowing that you know this platform that they have built up for me allows me to amplify my voice and solicit new innovators so that there's not only one Gitanjali and Anika, there's multiple of us across the world, which is exactly what I want to see in the future. Yeah, me too. A lot of them. <laughs> um, okay, 
So Annika, I heard you submitted your project when you were in ninth grade, right? And it wasn't always going to be focused on the cure for COVID-19. In fact, you were battering the flu when you got this idea. Yeah, I actually submitted my project in the end of eighth grade. It was like Ah. minutes before the deadline and it was about the influenza virus. Um, I started uh, with the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. That was kind of my inspiration for my project. And from there, I kind of moved forward and did a little bit more research. And I found out about the in silico methodology for drug discovery. And I learned about how you could use computational methods and technology to identify potential antivirals and um, medications for viruses and diseases. So I tried to use that to my advantage and find a potential antiviral against influenza virus. However, after I submitted the COVID-19 pandemic arose, and that was just kind of a huge shock to the face for everyone, I think. And uh, I collaborated with my mentor and we discussed that it would be best to change and pivot my um, project to target the SARS-CoV-2 virus because obviously that's made such a big impact on the world compared to the influenza virus in the past year. Yeah, that's just incredible. Um, and Geetanjali, tell us a little bit about your innovations. Yeah, so I work in a lot of different realms and every time I hear about Annika's project, I get so excited, especially because I love, you know, just learning about virology and kind of like the genetic applications of it as well. But I've watched countless videos about her too. So it, it freaks me out every time. I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Um, but I guess one of my most well-known uh, recognitions and inventions I created is called Tethys, which helps to detect lead in drinking water faster and more inexpensive than current tools out there today. Um, a couple years ago, I started up a new project called Epioni that's able to diagnose prescription opioid addiction um, using developments in protein detection methods. So a little bit similar to the spike protein that Annika was working on as well. Um, and now, I, well, not really now, uh, last year, I created a service called Kindly that's able to detect and prevent cyberbullying. And it's based on developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that many people across the world are already starting to use. Um, and beyond that, I have currently gone back to water um, and I'm looking at parasitic contaminants in water, which is definitely proving to be a lot more challenging than I thought it would be, but it's a fun project nonetheless. Um, That's so exciting. Okay. Your projects are amazing. And um, I had a lot of questions, but I had some friends who had a lot of questions as well. So we're going to take those if that's okay. Um, Let me cue up the first one. Hey, Benjali. My name is Anenya Goyle. I'm 12 years old, and I'd love to ask you a few questions. My first question is, what is the process by which you create your devices? With Tethys, for example, How did you figure out which materials work best? Can you tell us what worked, what didn't work, and what you would have done differently? My second question is, like you, I also love to bake and I'm curious. What was your favorite recipe that you tried during quarantine? Um, But with Tethys, um, I worked on the project actually uh, in the beginning of sixth grade, I want to say, and it was just an idea that I was basically concepting for a long time. I knew that I wanted to do something to tackle the crisis in Flint, Michigan, and I didn't exactly know what I was going to do or how I was going to do it, but I kind of just went with the flow and was able to look at how we can use carbon nanotube sensor technology to detect lead in water. Um, So the materials are are really hard to grab, especially because I was like 10 at the time, and so I was just countless cold emails and cold calling, which I can probably vouch for Annika, she probably did as well, and um, after countless no's, um, I guess there was one person who was willing to provide nanotubes, and they were, you know, basically my game changer. I was able to test them out, work with them, and my outer cover of my device is completely 3D printed. I developed all the microcontroller components by myself and wrote the app myself, but it obviously did take a while, and I'm still working on it every single day as well. Um, and as for quarantine recipes, I've been getting this question a lot, and I need to clarify that I am not good at baking. Like, I bake, but I am by all means not good at all. Um, so if I had to say something, I can make anything with apple. Like, it, it never turns out bad, but um, I make really good apple cobbler. And I think it's just my ratio of, like, apple to cinnamon to brown sugar, which is, like, perfection in my opinion. Well, you're going to have to email that to me so I can share that with my audience because I love a good cobbler too, but I have not gotten 
that ratio perfect yet. So it's, it's, it's just at this point, there's something in me that's like the recipe will say two cups of flour, but I'm like, no, I have to add three. <laughs> like, what's the worst that's, that's gonna your happen? secret? That's your <laughs> secret. Um, that's so funny. Um, so Annika, we have a fan for you. So let me pull that up. My name is Misha Goyle. I am nine years old. I live in Los Altos, California, and I have some questions for you. What is your favorite part about being a scientist, and what problems are you trying to solve right now? I love answering these. These are so fun. <laughs> She's so um, cute. <laughs> Uh, my favorite part about being an aspiring scientist is being able to ask questions and look for those answers. I think that's so important in science and you have to be curious and look for those things in the world that you can ask questions about and more importantly, find answers to. So that's definitely one of my favorite parts about being a potential scientist. And I think the second, what, what was the second part of our question too? Like who motivated you? For me, um, my initially my grandfather motivated me to go into science and because he was a chemistry professor and he used to always kind of push me and do all these little experiments with me like building a volcano or learning the periodic table of elements and slowly that kind of motivated me into going into science and then after that I kind of went on my own. It wasn't something like a big spike or something. It was more like a gradual interest in science that um, helped me pursue my passions. Yeah. We have more and more questions, people. There are so many pe there. I put on a little call out and I have gotten so many. And in a way, it's so good because they drew my job for me. We have one more here. Hi, my name is Siva Patel and I'm nine years old and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have two questions to ask you. My first question is that what were your hobbies when you were my age? And my second question is that who motivated you the most outside of your family? Is this for me or Annika or both? I think it's for both, but why don't you start, Keitha and Jolly? Okay, so um, I think, okay, there's a lot of like different elements to this because I have pursued a lot of those hobbies that I was that kid, which was like, you name it, I did it. Like, mm -hmm. even the dumbest thing, like I ice skated, I did clay class, like I didn't even know that was a thing, like sculpting classes are apparently a thing. Um, I did all of those things, um, but the things that I've really stuck with and will continue to stick with is fencing. Um, I fence, which is almost like a really cool version of sword fighting. Um, <laughs> it's a great anger management technique as well. And um, I play the piano and the bass guitar. And again, we heard my baking obsession. And uh, apart from that, I, I live in Colorado. So I'm always outside going on hikes or, you know, walking. And then apart from that, this doesn't really count as like a hobby or a passion, but I count it, which is just like binge watching TV for hours on it. I can do, I can spend hours watching a movie or a tv show what are you watching right now or what are your favorite what do you recommend let me say that so so okay the thing is i my attention span is super low when it comes to tv shows so i'll like leave off halfway so i'm a movie person but i will watch the whole jurassic park series yes. and any of the avengers movies yes so good um what about you annika uh, personally, I have to agree with Gitanjali on this one. I was that kid who did like ice skating and every single random thing I could find. Um, but the things that I really took forward and um, pushed myself with were dance, um, reading, reading bunches of books at a time, and just like spending time with family and friends because I know that doesn't really count as a hobby, but that's something that was always there for me. Um, I've been doing Bharatanatyam, which is Indian classical dance for a long time. And it's always just been a really amazing way to um, divert myself or just like find beauty in the dance form. And um, just spending time with family and friends just comes naturally with me. I just like, sometimes I'll just travel up to my sister's room and annoy her for a couple minutes just to get my mind off things. And then reading books is just an amazing way to get away from the real world, I guess. And right now I'm reading the, the Great Gatsby and I started the first yes. few pages right before this call actually. And I have no idea what's happening so far in the book, but it seems really interesting, so. Well, it, and it's an interesting time to read it because a lot of people say that what the phase that we're gonna be entering next is going to be like the Roaring Twenties. So it's a great book. I love that book. Um, 
you both you mentioned dance and I am a big dancer myself um but before I get into that I felt like this year has been such a banner year for Indian Americans, especially females, right? With the vice president elect Kamala Harris about to be sworn in very soon. It's exciting to see someone of our South Asian Indian heritage, someone who looks like us sort of take office. And one of the things that I think is unique to our culture is Indian classical dance. And it's something, like I said, I pursued, and I think it has like this, discipline and passion needed to kind of do that right and I was so excited when Annika you said you did Bharat Natyam and um, Gitanjali while you did not mention this I heard from a very special person that you are a Kathak dancer which I am as well so let's go um, <laughs> and I feel like Indian classical art is this amazing bridge between left and right brain analytical and creative you both get, you both literally have an amazing mind and have created and solved problems. Do you feel that like you're pulling from both sides of your brain? I mean, where, where do those sparks come from? I think there's like this concept of left and right sided brain that I never really fully understood until recently. And that thing is because I've always combined the two. And I'm, I bet I'm speaking for Annika on this as well, and she can totally expand. But then there's this idea of like, when we innovate, when I personally come up with ideas, I need both that design aspect and that analytical aspect. Like with my devices and stuff, like how do I create an organic shape that people want to use, people like to look at? How do I meet my design criteria? But at the same time, get the job done and I think the same applies to Kathak as well which I don't know how I missed it but I dance Kathak and um yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's so it's honestly such a beautiful art form and I've danced for about 10 years now wow. so yeah every single you know like step of my day I've I draw from both sides of my brain, just knowing that everything that I do has both aspects to it. And I don't think anything in this world could be accomplished without both aspects. 100%. Annika? I totally agree with the, what Kitanjali said. Um, Indian classical dance, it's just really amazing. And there's so many styles and each one assesses grace and beauty in a different way. Um, I've been doing Bharatanatyam for yeah almost 10 years now, but I initially started with Kuchipudi. So um, Kuchipudi like a couple years and then Bharatanatyam a couple years. And it's just, it's such an amazing way. Yeah, you really have to pull from both sides of the brain because choreography, you need that grace, but you also need that creativity and you need to learn how to involve all aspects of the dance in one way that's most aesthetic and looks the best and still is challenging for the dancer. So it's really amazing. And it's just been an amazing way for me to express myself as well. Yeah, speaking of expression, you know, one of the things about Indian classical dance is it's a lot about storytelling. In fact, the word kata from kathak means storyteller. You both are such incredible storytellers. I mean, to be able to take these complex ideas, a lot of people have a lot of inventions and ideas, but to have that sort of second part, to be able to explain to people how it can apply to them. Do, I mean, talk to me about that. Where did you both become such great communicators? I have to say, I was never, initially, I was not a good communicator. It was hard for me to get my ideas out and be able to explain myself in a way that was understandable and a way that could be um, communicated and put forward in a way that was just understood by everyone and was something that people wanted to take forward themselves. Um, so it really comes with practice, I think. Um, I communicate with my family and I learned, I've learned to um, ask out for help with these things and just um, try out to just communicate like um, like I'll practice with my family my friends and just make sure like that they are able to understand it. and if they have any questions I'm able to answer it in a way that's understandable and a way that's clear and concise and I think it really just comes with practice I was never um, initially good at communicating and I'm still learning as I go Gita Anjali yeah, drawing a little bit off of that, it probably doesn't seem like it now, but one of my biggest fears was public speaking. Um, I was so scared of talking in public, but um, 
my parents, I really owe all of this to my parents. It's just the idea they put me in risky situations that I, they knew I'd hate, but I realized that that's why I'm here now is, you know, I did public speaking competitions. I was in like Toastmasters camps and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I was, I even got elected president of one, I think in middle school, but it was just like every single step of my day was trying to get over that fear. And I kept that in mind. And I think you know, when that fear broke was actually when I was presenting on stage at the Young Scientist Challenge a long time ago. And I bet Anika also agrees with this because when you're, when you're, well, because you did a video, but still similarly, when you're recording and when you're, you know, in that moment, you feel like I know my story better than anyone else out here does. So, you know, it should be up to me to really put it out there. And um, I still owe it to everyone across my journey who has made me the person that I am today and now sharing my story and speaking in public is some of the you know some of the things that I do constantly and some of my favorite things that I'm doing in the work that I do you know speaking of getting over your fear and really confidence is what you both are also talking about um you know Gitanjali you built an app for cyberbullying and now that you've been thrusted into the public eye I mean have you have did you experience bullying is that why you created it how do you deal with it yeah so i guess thinking back to it now i was insulted a lot in elementary and middle school and it's not considered bullying now it was the little things like you didn't kick the soccer ball in the right location hence you are dumb like stuff like that and um i i think that now that i look back at it as these sensitive girl that I was like the shortest in the class the smallest everywhere and I moved to seven different schools in the past 10 years of my life I was always secluded and you know didn't really feel at home anywhere and um it just I hit me in a hard place I realized that imagine what happens if this happens at a bigger scale so that's really what my inspiration was for it my dad used to joke around that um like oh, go look for the bullies. And if you can't find one, you are the bully. And um, I think like just, just having that experience as firsthand is obviously thrusted me to create something else that prevents this from happening to anyone else. Because personally, I know it's heart-wrenching when people yeah. tell you you are not worth it or you know you, the work that you're doing is not beneficial. And obviously in these, this past month as well, as I... Um, have slowly become more of a public figure, which is still scary for me to say. There have been hate comments, but I've basically turned into a brick wall and they bounce back off of me like it's nothing because, you know, at the end of the day, I know what I'm doing is good for positive change. And I wouldn't want to stop what I'm doing and it's what I'm passionate about. So if others don't see that, then that's that, it's not gonna affect me in any way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, Annika, there's a lot of stats and data around um, this idea that boys are sort of, let's say at this point in an unbiased way, I don't even think it's like consciously anymore, but they're sort of told by so many messages to pursue math and science and girls, while we are starting to celebrate women in STEM, the reality is we just don't see enough women in these amazing positions. There clearly is a gender disparity um, especially in STEM. So Annika, like, have you dealt with that? Like, what are your thoughts? Personally, I've grown up in an environment which uh, supports women in STEM, supports girls in math and science. And I'm really, really lucky to be in that sort of environment. But I honestly wish I wouldn't have to say I was lucky. I wish that was a norm everywhere. It's so disappointing to see people push back girls just because of their gender and define people by their gender when they each person just has their own potential, has their own talents, and they just need to be unleashed. And that's such a big part of today's society that needs to be changed. Um, I think a lot of people are just not willing to change. I think that's one of the biggest problems in today's society. People are not open to change, and that really needs to change. Um, people need to see that every person on this planet has potential. And if we're taking out half the population, half the population of girls and pushing them back, then we're losing so much of that potential. And we need to try harder to push, push girls forward in any way that we can, because they deserve that chance um, just as much as anyone else does. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You guys, I'm going to start to cry. You two are so great. <laughs> um, I want to talk about mentors a little bit because, you know, how like 
how did you find mentors? Did you just like teach people your age? In fact, teach grownups. Did you just email people? Like, how did it work? And who are the mentors in your life? Kathanjali, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, so mentorship is obviously something that's very, very hard for anybody, but especially for young innovators and young aspiring scientists, especially because a lot, we're, you know, as much as we don't want to say it, we are undermined for our age. And, you know, reaching out to someone is, it, it requires like a day of reading over the email being like, is this perfection? Is this exactly how I want it to be? And then sending it or like, literally what I used to do before, um, when I was creating Tethys was, write down bullet points and then call them up and basically read them word for word just because I was so scared of getting that no from them just being like no I don't want to help you but now I've realized that the worst answer you can get is no mm -hmm. and you can go always go back to them or go back to someone else so what I'm currently advocating for is harnessing the ingenuity of youth because we do bring that new perspective and we're just we're just looked at as, you know, since we're younger, we can't do as much. But I feel like, um, you know, people like Annika, people like me are starting to break those barriers. And the the position that these huge organizations have put us in, like Discovery Education, 3M, Time, Nickelodeon, um, have allowed us to gain mentors. Like Shah Rukh Khan. Can Shah I just Khan, say? Yes, of course. <laughs> Ed, all dead. Kitanjali was introduced by Shah Rukh Khan. Like, uh, we're, we're going to talk about that later, but proceed. <laughs> yeah, no, but like just that whole concept of these huge people, celebrities, organizations who are really pushing forward to advocate for mentorship for youth. Like even the Young Scientist Challenge provided me a mentor for the first time. And it felt like the Holy Grail. It felt like all my prayers had been answered. And, you know, that's the, that just having the opportunity to work with a mentor has made me who I am, knowing that I can write an email and I can get a positive response if I really want to. Um, and then you said mentors in my life, um, quite a few. Obviously all the experts and researchers that I work with to develop my products, especially Dr. Selene Hernandez Ruiz from Denver Water, who helped me out with Tethys, as well as, you know, Dr. Kathleen Schaefer, who was my Young Scientist Challenge mentor. And then we have Dr. McMurray at the University of Colorado Denver, who helped me out with opioid addiction. Um, and then all sorts of teachers from everywhere. It's so hard to name everyone, but those are some of the biggest people in my life. Annika? Um, yeah, I think mentorship is really such an amazing experience. You get to seek that meaningful advice and help and guidance from an individual who's really had experience in that field. Um, throughout my life, I've had quite a few mentors, honestly. Uh, my parents, uh, my teachers from school, and then obviously Dr. Mafuza Ali from the 3M and Discovery Education Young Scientist Challenge. I remember the first time I asked to seek a mentor, I wrote my first email by myself was after my first science fair and I got this contact back from one of the judges and she was like, you should contact this person and they might write, write you back because they were researching on the same field or something. And I worked all day on that email and I wrote it and I got back an answer and it said no. Um, and that was my first time I'd ever asked anyone for help and I got back a no. And at that moment, I was so scared um, for that response. But after I got that no, I kind of, the, the fear kind of broke. It was like, okay, it's a no, what am I gonna do about it? Just go forward and ask another person. So um, don't be afraid to get that answer. Don't be afraid to reach out to more people because again, like Ethanjali said, um, the worst answer you can get is no. So just continue pushing forward and you're bound to get someone, someone's bound to say yes, uh, whoever that may be. So just keep asking and keep reaching out because it's really important to reach out for help. So yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a numbers game too. I mean, the reality is it's sort of a numbers game and really like a no could still be a yes, like you also said, Kitan Jelly. So just keep reaching out and being a young person and reaching out to people, I think you also have an advantage because, you know, young people are super cute. And <laughs> everyone wants to help a kid out. But I think for the grownups listening, this is such a great opportunity for you to sit and think, how can I reach down and mentor younger kids? And I think for the younger kids listening, like, don't be fearful. Like the rejection, I mean, like you said, Annika, your first email back was a no, hello. I would have been mortified. In fact, grownups still get mortified with rejection. So I think your advice is such, um, it's so sound. Um, and then just generally though, can you both reemphasize why you think mentorship is so important? Because I think a lot of kids think they can just Google it and figure it out, which you can, but what, what 
is a benefit of really sort of overcoming the bubbles you may have to reach out to a mentor? Yeah, to kick this off a little bit, I'll just give like a really brief description. I think as a kid, it's important to have that support system, yes. especially going forward. And having a mentor defines that for you, whether that mentor is your friend or your parents or researchers that you've worked with. Having someone that you can go back to for questions is important. And that mentor should not only be a mentorship, it should be, you know, a friendship, a relationship with them, helping to really take off not only your product, but you as well as a person. Yeah. Yeah, like Keith Anjali was saying, um, a mentorship, it's really a friendship. I remember I was that kid who thought I could just Google search everything and get it over with. <laughs> but my first mentorship, my first real mentorship was with Dr. Mahfouza Ali. And I, over that mentorship, it wasn't only just asking questions. It wasn't only just getting information out of her. It was really, it grew to be like this really good relationship between us. And I remember the moment after I won the competition, she had taken so many photos of me uh, on her um, on her iPhone and they were all super blurry and she sent them to me and I started laughing about it. But it's really just that relationship that you get that in person, well, not in person, but that relationship that you get between each other where you can just go and ask questions and seek meaningful um, answers from a person who's really had a lot of experience in their field. They've learned and they've failed numerous times and they've um, invented numerous things maybe, but they have that experience that you don't have. And that's so important because they can guide you and um, help you learn how to move forward with your project or whatever you're doing. You know, you both have mentioned rejection and failure. And to me, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but I think it was Benjamin Franklin talked about failure and innovation. And basically it was something like he failed like hundreds and thousands of times before he invented things, right? So you both must have had your inventions fail. How, how did you not get discouraged? And can you tell us about your best failure? Best failure. I love yes. that. Best um, failure. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think some of the, I think the whole concept of like failure um, is another step to success. I like, I think it was Dr. Cindy Moss, who's from Discovery Education. She says, um, fail is first attempt in learning. She told me this and I was like, wow, I'm using that everywhere. And um, it's, it's really stuck with me knowing that failure is such a good thing because if you if I didn't fail my devices would not be at the stage it is today and I think beyond that my best failure I have to say and this is my funniest one too is when I was basically so discouraged for one whole day because my device was reading zeros when it was supposed to be reading resistance values and it wasn't plugged in the whole time so yeah, that's what you get for um, you know, from America's top young scientists in time kid of the year for getting to plug in a device. Everyone makes mistakes, you know? Yes. It's, it's not like, it's not something that should be discouraged upon. And my biggest thing of jumping back is no, one, knowing it's okay to take breaks. And two, knowing that, the, what am I doing? What is the bigger picture for why I am doing this? And that always helps me bounce back. Anika. Um, yeah, for me, uh, my biggest failure would have to be this one time I was using a new software, which I'd never used before, and there was a really um, vague uh, instruction manual, and I didn't really know how to use that and how to like get information out of that. So I remember I put in all my input, and I put it in the software, and it said it was going to take like three weeks to run. So I waited those three weeks, and I was so sure of myself. I was like, okay, this is going to work. I'm not even going to check up on it. And I waited those three weeks, and I came back, and then it said like error message, fatal error on the first thing. So I just waited those three weeks for no reason. And I remember I was so discouraged. I was like, oh my God, three weeks and the deadline for my project was coming up. But um, it was just a really good learning experience I learned after that. Um, even through that failure, you learned that it was actually one simple error I had made, which had cost those three weeks, but it was a really good learning experience. And like Keith Anjali said, um, it's important to take breaks and important to realize that it's okay to fail and it's okay to take a break from what you're doing and relax a little bit and then go back to it, which is what I did. I talked to my family, I baked for a bit and I went back to that and I started again. Speaking of taking breaks and doing something else, I mean, you both have spoken about how when you were younger and even now you have so many interests and I'm 
a big proponent of that personally, um, having a lot of dimensions to who you are. But I think a big question, especially as a mother myself and, you know, thinking about my own son is how do you balance it all as kids, like wanting to achieve and do something big, but just how, how are you two handling the balance of everything that you do? Yeah. Um, I think the whole concept of balancing time is something that I still have not perfected. And it's still so hard for me to be like, do not procrastinate this because you don't want to do it on the last day to do. But I, I'm just like every other kid out there. And just like every other kid out there, I do procrastinate. And I, it's so hard for me to manage my time. But the biggest thing I like to say is I'm a strong believer of doing what you want to do, not what you need yeah. to do. And yeah. I love the workshops that I run. I love my innovations. Um, I love, you know, spending time with people like you talking about my story, hearing from other fantastic people. So I find ways to do everything, but it doesn't seem like work to me at that point. So that makes every step of the process that much easier, knowing that, hey, like everything that I'm doing is just for fun. And if you get stressed out, then stop it because you have the power to do that. Mm hmm. Yeah, Love going that. on exactly what Gitanjali said, what I do, I really like what I do. So it's rather than just like some work that I'm doing or something that I'm made to do, it's it's like a hobby. It's something that I love doing and I want to continue doing. So it never seemed like something that I had to do or I had to set aside time to do just so I could do it. Um, it's really just been something I could use to take my mind off school or something like that. Um, it's just been a really amazing process, really amazing adventure to um, go about innovation and scientific adventure and processes. Um, other than that, yeah, I'm super bad at time management. I'm the procrastinator in the house, and I'm the person who waits the last minute to do that school project or the last minute to read the chapters in the book. Um, but my biggest advice would be to, when you need to do it, just take a break, take a rest, and set, set everything aside and do something that you really like. For me, that's just science. I like reading science books and things like that. And um, whatever it is, just set aside some time to just take a break and then go back to whatever you're doing. Yeah, you both are talking about um, productivity. You're talking about time management. Um, you're also talking about taking breaks, which is super important because it, it helps you just do better at what you are passionate about. But I think one of the things that we all learn as dancers is discipline. I mean, if you're gonna learn a new tukra, if you learned it, I'm sorry, you have to practice it a couple of times at least before your next class. Otherwise, we both know what happens, right? And <laughs> so I, we've learned how to sort of modulate big things, right? Big dance pieces into little chunks. How do you sort of use that as a metaphor to break down all the things you're doing? Because I think it's important for um, everyone to hear that, you know, there needs to be some level of consistency and discipline on a daily basis too to achieve big things. Would you agree or not? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, just with my solid foundation in dance as well, that applies to everything that I do. Like I'll have this huge choreo that I need to learn by next week and I can't not practice it. And so I'll break it down into, okay, I know this tokra, which is in there. And I know this tora, which is also in there. So now I just need to learn the part that I don't know. And this, you know, part A repeats like six times, part B repeats like three times. And these are just like two parts that I'm struggling the most with. And it's the same for when you're coming up with an idea is breaking it down into this is what I need to repeat. This is what I know I'm good at, but what is the stuff that's in the gaps? What are the things that I need to learn? And that makes every step of the process that much cleaner, that much easier. And it makes me want to keep going because I'm not, overwhelmed with how much I have to do like sometimes if you hear about my work it's like wow it has so many components but in reality it's like well I already know how to do five of the six things because of another device I worked on now I just need to learn one one sixth of it yeah what about you Annika I completely agree um I think dance has really shaped that for me um that consistency I remember during my first year of dance I used to not really practice I used to be the kid who used to um, go to dance class and then forget to practice because I was doing something else like watching TV. But um, I really learned to instill that discipline in myself and um, learn to put thing, put aside time to do things and put a schedule for it. Even for school, I think high school has really helped me learn how to do that. Um, learn time management and get a schedule. Um, I put uh, like a, I have a little planner and I stick by that every day. I make sure to 
do the things on my schedule and cross it out that like relief when you cross out that thing on your planner and then move to the next day. So I think it's really important to take um, your life one day at a time. So you have one day, um, put aside a schedule and make sure you get everything done on that schedule for that day and then move to the next day. Forget about the past, use what you learned from the past and then put that forward to the future. So I think that's really important. Yeah. But I think the takeaway on top of uh, including everything that you both said is so spot on is that you need to work every day. I mean, you, you can't just like have a goal and, uh, and just, you know, always wait to the last minute. Right. So I think that it's that consistency and work ethic that helps us achieve our dreams and our goals as well. Um, and I love that you both, um, can share that. I think that's going to going to teach a lot of people how to achieve all the things that they want to achieve. So we have one more question from another friend. Hi, my name is Amira. I live in Saratoga, California, and I'm 11 years old. I have two questions. The first one is, how did you first know what you were passionate about? And the second one is, what advice do you have for people my age that might be interested in helping the world but don't know where to start? Thank you. Um, Okay, I'll answer the first part and then I have to think about the second part a little bit. So I'll let Annika answer and then I'll talk. Um, So the first part is I, science was always intuitive for me. Like it's always something that I loved. I loved seeing reactions, things change. Mm -hmm. But I soon learned that I wanted to combine that with my passion for making a difference in society. So I started looking at science for kindness, which is what I do every day, which is innovation. And that's that's really what changed my life forever, was looking at, you know, I want to combine science with kindness and I want to solve problems for the better. And that's the reason I am an aspiring scientist and an engineer today, just because that's what I love to do. I love to make change in this world. Um, yeah, Anika. Um, My advice, or. Uh, how do you know when you're passionate about something? That was the question. And yeah. I, think, I, no, I think a lot of kids have so many passions. It's hard for them to choose. Um, I think, you know, when you're passionate about something, when you stop doing it and then you miss it. Um, for me, when I just put aside my project for a while, um, I start to miss doing it. I start to miss working on it. And same thing for dance. I'll stop. I took a break from dance for a while and now I miss it and I want to go back to it and I want to keep working on it. So, you know, you're passionate about something when you miss doing it, you miss working on it. So find that thing for you, maybe take a break from it and see how you feel. Um, What was the second question? I forgot about it. I love that advice, by the way. I'm gonna use it for myself. (laughs) But the second question for both of you was, what advice do you have for people her age who want to do something amazing for the world, but just really don't know where to start? I think my advice would be to ask questions. Um, Whatever the question may be, just, Look at something and then see how you can change it. See what you can do and ask questions and don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, so let's say for me, I ask questions on drug discovery and that's what got me started on my project. Um, so it's not necessarily a spark or an idea that you suddenly get. You need to ask that question to get to that idea. Um, so whatever that may be, just ask that question and don't be afraid to look for answers and seek new things in that answer. Yeah. Yeah. And to kind of add on to that first question as well, um, yeah, kind of straight away, but like the whole idea of finding your passion is, oh, I totally agree with Annika there, especially regarding the idea that if you love something so much that you want to go back to it every single day, that's your passion. That's what you want to do. And I think it's just, don't be afraid to try new things. That's what I did. And that's how I figured out what I love to do. Um, And then to answer the second question, if you don't know where to start, I have this term that I always keep in the back of my mind, which is ikigai. And ikigai is the Japanese word for reason for being. And the whole concept is try to find, you know, something you like to do, your vision and your goals and see what, you know, if you combine everything, what's in that middle part? Like what is stuff that you love to do? So I love teaching, I love science, and I love spreading my message. So I run workshops for students around the globe to be able to do the same thing. And that's find your Iggy guys so you know where to start. Find your reason for being. And that could be, you know, through art, music, science, anything. But if you have that passion, you can go towards making a change in the world. 
I love that. It's a Japanese concept that you can Google. There are books written on it. There's a ton of blog posts now too. So thank you so much for bringing that up. That's brilliant. Um, all right. So I have just like a lot of random questions that I'm curious about. Do you have siblings and do you fight with them? I have one younger brother and I fight with him every day. There all we right. go. I'm an older sister and I still fight with my baby brother. So good. All right, Annika. <laughs> I have an older brother and a younger sister. And yes, we fight all the time over the littlest things that don't even matter, but it's fun to it's fight. Like, on have you ever dealt with like the orange juice situation? Like I'll be, I'll be tasked to pour the orange juice and he hates it because I'm so biased. So like I'll put like one extra drop and then like switch the cups like eight times. So he doesn't know which is which, but I know. I, I'm so mean. I'm such a bad older sister, but he's also like a very annoying younger brother, but it's fine. We both balance out each other with our skills. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Do you have pets? Nope. <laughs> no pets. All right. What are your favorite foods? Like absolute, you could only pick one. You're going to Mars and you can only pick one food. What is it? I'm going to say a very cliche answer. And it's going to be pizza. But <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Annika? Uh, I don't know. It's either ice cream. It's, I feel really bad saying this because um, my mom tells me I have to be healthier and stuff. But ice cream, chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream. I'm sorry. I had to say Stop. it. It's like, you know, when, when you buy like those whole chocolate cakes with like chocolate icing and chocolate everything. And then my dad's like, it's too much chocolate. I'm like, there's no such thing. <laughs> I can agree. So I think the key is you both need to go to Mars together because you'll have a complete meal, pizza and then ice cream. <laughs> I mean, we'll probably die of like something before, we, before like we get back down. But you know what? It's worth it for pizza and ice cream. I couldn't agree more. Um, do you both journal or have a diary? Ooh, I have like an online one, which I write in once in a while when I'm like, trying to figure out what to do. I'm a very weird person. I will talk out loud. Mm. Like that's my journal. <laughs> and <laughs> you could do a voice record journal, you know, like an audio. Yeah, journal. I haven't really thought about that, but no, I'll be like, I, like something really dumb. Like I was, we were driving to Texas actually for um, New Year's. We were going to Austin and I was in the passenger seat and I was just like talking out loud about the homework I have. And my mom's like, what are you doing? But yeah, no, like that's my journal, I guess. What about you, Annika? For me, I have a planner, but that's just like to write things down. But other than that, I don't really journal. I wanted to do an art journal for a long time where I just kind of like write down ideas but that takes like a lot of patience, which I do not have. Um, but honestly, I do talk to myself a lot. I'll just like be in my room and then talk to myself about the randomest things. I'm like my own friend, I guess. That's really lonely. That's, and that's so like, sad, but I agree. <laughs> that's so bad, but yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> you both are so cute. Um, well, I highly encourage both of you to maybe keep audio journals because, you know, you girls are amazing and people in the future are going to be dying to know what your thoughts were even now. And honestly, there's so much science behind how journaling and putting your thoughts and then going back and reading them can have such a positive impact. So I encourage you to do that. All right. So, yes. Gita Anjali, I need to know in detail about meeting Shah Rukh Khan. In detail. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> see, I barely remember that day too, because we were I was in India for almost like- but Pause one second, because yes. you might not remember every detail, but you could Google Gitanjali Rao, <laughs> TED Talk, Shah Rukh Khan. The whole world saw the moment. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. I was there a week before and I actually, I think I, they accidentally gave me his dressing room and it was a very pretty, that I need to tell you, first of all. And then they were like, no, go to the other one. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it was. It was honestly such a cool experience. I think I spent four or five hours with him that day. It was very in-depth conversations about absolutely nothing most of the time. It was like, what did you eat for dinner? And I was like, nothing. He's like, go eat food. It, it was like, it was a very relaxing conversation. One of my favorite things he said actually during this whole experience was, um, he was like, where do you live? And I said, Denver, Colorado. He's like, I have a friend who lives there. And he's like, and I'm like, oh, who? He's like, Madhuri Addiction. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, he's a fantastic person, and I'm, you know, I'm so honored to have had that opportunity, and um, it's something that I will never forget. And um, 
Yeah, he I'm I, he's just such a great down to earth person. My family all met him as well, and um, I think they all just tagged along for him, not for me, but it's okay. Um, but <laughs> it, it, it was still a fantastic experience nonetheless, and I wouldn't take back a moment of it. Yeah, it was you. Ha- you gave an incredible talk. So for Thank everyone you. listening, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to Google Keithanjali's TED Talk. Um, yeah, the really hard thing was I actually did. I had to learn the talk in both Hindi and English and I'm not fluent in Hindi. I don't speak Hindi at all. So I had a coach working with, I speak Telugu and Tamil, but Hindi was a whole nother avenue. And my mom and dad speak like this weird Hindi dialect that no one understands. But um, (laughs) yeah, so like I I spoke, I I did a talk in Hindi and that was so scary because I couldn't mess up something because I would say something else and then I did in English, um, but it actually, the whole thing ended at 2 a.m. It was so, it was a lot. It was a long night, but I had so much fun with it. That's amazing. You know, Annika, you have probably had so many opportunities come your way. And it's one of the things that um, I love about even just like, excellence is when you do something and you put yourself out there, doors open up at any age. And so Anik, and we see that with Gitanjali and Shah Rukh Khan, of course, <laughs> but Anika, you know, you were sort of at the beginning of your spotlight journey. What are some cool things that have happened to you already? Um, one of the cool things is I've met a lot of people, a lot of people that I've never imagined I would ever be able to talk to. And I've been able to share my story and then get to know these other people and their stories, which has really impacted the way I've seen other things. Um, there's this guy, his name is Taft Foley, and he was, he has this like his own, he was like the youngest ever ENT, and he has his own like vaccination um, travel bus, so people don't, uh, not vaccination, not yet, but like um, this testing travel bus, and he used to go to people and then go around his neighborhood or things, and then get like testing that could rapid testing so people would be able to know their test results in like um just like 15 minutes or things like that and it was just really amazing to see all these stories and get to know so many people from so many aspects of so many places and then get all those stories and have that impact on myself and get to remember that yeah I love that um you were on CNN with him I watched this interview yeah Yeah, it was so good you did so good on that Well, we'll have to look it up. Let's Google it, everyone. (laughs) Um, You know, what advice, like, you know, part of the reason why I wanted to celebrate the both of you and talk about um, all the opportunities you have is because I want more young people to put their ideas out there. So what sort of advice do you have? You know, you, you both enter the 3M competition, which is great. So for maybe someone out there with a science project or an idea that's STEM based, give them your like tips and tricks and insight or know-how of how to kind of like, you know, go through the system. The system. Yeah. I guess to really get that slight edge, the whole thing is if you, if you're displaying your passion and if you're displaying your hard work, it's a done deal. And I think that that's what we saw. Like even, oh my God, 2017 seems so long ago, but even that year I was in St. Paul with um, nine other fantastic people who I still all talk to this day. And um, it, it was like, the energy from each other radiated and like the first day we did this little scavenger hunting which I don't think I've ever said in any interview but like we literally it, we were like sticking straws and stuff in potatoes and it was the most chaotic experience of everyone's life but um yeah that dinner that night my brother he he came along he wanted one of the potatoes so we all signed it and put like our favorite science equation on it or something. And I, th- wow. I think it like brought it or something. I don't know. We have to find the potato later, but um, yeah, it was like, just, it's not only our passion for science and engineering, but our passion for meeting others just like us. And the amount that radiates off of each and every one of us, because we love what we do. And I think that's, that's exactly what anybody's looking for in a candidate in a student is that, do you love what you're doing? Do you love the problems that you're solving? So it's not necessarily for competitions, for schools, for colleges. Instead, it's for yourself, for benefiting the community. Yeah. What about you, Annika? That's amazing advice. Um, And say, yeah, don't be afraid 
Um, and have confidence because when you have a project, it's your project. You know what you're doing because that's your project. That's your story to tell. And no one else knows it better than you do. So whatever you say and wherever you present it, you have to know that and be sure to like keep that confidence in you But when you know that. Um, and then aside from that, just don't miss any opportunity. Sometimes um, it feels really overwhelming to take on opportunities because they seem really big. And then you're like, oh my gosh, when am I ever going to get there, get to that point where I can actually um, move forward in that opportunity or get something out of that opportunity. But you really never know where you're going to go um, when you um, have an opportunity. So don't be afraid to take it. And then, yeah, it's just so amazing to meet so many people. I, I remember my experience with the 3M Young Scientist Challenge, um, the nine other finalists. And I remember um, Miss Betsy Clausen. Uh, she was the person. I love Betsy. <laughs> She called me like 10 minutes before I had to present. I was nervous. I was literally sweating. And then she called me and then I was like, can you please talk to me? I'm going to cry if you don't talk to me. And then she talked to me those 10 minutes and then calmed me down. And then I met the other finalists after. And then we all talked about the most randomest things. And then it was just so fun to meet so many other people and then get that connection with them. So don't be afraid to take on opportunities and challenges because you really never know where you're going to end up. No, yeah. Betsy's the best. I didn't know she was still doing it. Yeah, she she took me on a walk around the whole 3M headquarters before my speech. So yeah, yeah. shout out to Betsy. <laughs> um, Really quick, because we only have a few more minutes. Can yeah. you, like, I'm just thinking about the person listening who's like, what resources, what YouTube channel should I be looking at? What should I read? What websites? Like, let's just shoot off a few things for people to get going today. Ooh, research journals. Um, Which one? Can you say that again? Um, I just go on like the research journal database and, and then you can find a bunch off of there and then you can see which research journal you can go into and then more specific off of that. I recommend that. Um, that's a really good way to start off if you have an idea or something then in mind that you want to go more deeper into. So that's where I would go. Keep Agreed. Yeah. Any sort of like technology reviews, research journals, fantastic. Also just watch the news. That's what I did. That's how I got insight. Mm -hmm. Watch the news. It's so, it's so boring sometimes and so annoying sometimes, but um, yeah, I like, I used to watch like, was it NBC kids or CNN kids? I used to watch it like religiously every day. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, I, you, you gain so much knowledge from it, even about, even if there are things that are irrelevant to what you're working on, it might be someday relevant. So yeah, watch the news, read, read, just read in general, because you will gain a lot of insight. Don't worry about what you're reading, just read. <laughs> what message do you want to leave people with? What have I not asked? Or what do you want people to know? Ooh, I'm going to say dream big and then think back to reality. Because I think everything that we're doing, and like, even for Annika and I, like, these are things that we never thought we would accomplish one day. These are things that we were like, wow, I wish I could like, create a device. I wish I could meet Shah Rukh Khan, right? And yeah. you're like, and it all you comes know. I'm going to keep dreaming too. <laughs> yeah, no, and then do a little something. And we were talking about working hard every single day. So do a little something every day to meet, meet that dream. Because no, if you're really passionate about it, it will come true one day. Annika. I, I completely agree. Um, I remember right before I entered the 3M and Discovery Education Young Science Challenge, I was looking at past entries and I looked at Geethanjali's profile and everything. I was like super inspired. And that really motivated me to actually um, go into that. And I never, ever thought I would get selected as a finalist or let alone that America's top young scientist. But um, I, I was passionate about it and I really wanted to get there. So I put forward my best effort. So my advice would be to um, whatever your goal is, don't let that be the thing that you, the only thing that you go towards. The, the thing that's important is to just give your best effort in whatever you do, because um, and at the end of the day, you want to go home, whether you win a competition or not, or whether you do something in this or not, you want to go home knowing that you did your best and then you gave your best effort at that moment when you were presenting or maybe you were talking to someone or anything. Just give your best effort in wherever you go. My final, final question is if people want to connect with you both, want to leave you messages, how can they best do that? Do you have YouTube channels? Like what's going on? How can people talk to you? Yeah. Um, for, oh, wait, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I recommend Twitter for me. Um, my profile is Anika Chabrolu. So you just type up my name on Twitter and then message me and I'll try to respond. Yeah. 
Yeah, for me, I have a little bit more. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter and Instagram at Gitanjali A. Rao, and then also my website, GitanjaliRao.net, on the contact form, and my LinkedIn at Gitanjali Rao. And then I also have a YouTube channel called Just STEM Stuff, where you can reach out to me, and I will be sure to respond because I love talking to other people who are just as passionate about STEM as I am. Yeah, and Annika, I want to give a shout out to Academy A. Do you want to talk about that really quick? I would love to. Um, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, Academy Aid is a nonprofit organization that my brother and I actually started a couple years ago. We took a trip to India and we saw, um, we were on our way to visit my mom's school and on the way we saw another school and in that school, it was a government high school. So they, um, and a lot of the girls I noticed, um, they didn't come to school. We talked with the principal and we noticed that a lot of the girls didn't come to school because they didn't have um, proper uniforms and they were embarrassed to come to school in um, their old uniforms. And so that really motivated me and pushed me forward. My brother and I decided to move forward with the idea to help children receive a well-rounded education and give them the materials and resources they need to achieve that. And so we started Academy Aid a couple years ago. And then recently it was actually, um, we put it forward as a 501c3 organization, so an actual organization. And now we're just building off of that and continuing to motivate um, to people to donate. And so if you do want to donate, go make sure to visit academyaid.org. So that'd be really amazing for us. And um, it, it's really um, amazing for you to donate. So please do do that. And um, your donations will go through to schools and it will help um, fund for the project we're actually donating for. Um, so go make sure to check that out. There's more information on the website if you want to do that because talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. And we need more Gitanjali's and more Annika. So thank you both. I think I speak for literally every person listening right now. We are so, so very proud of both of you. You both not only have brilliant minds, but you have a beyond generous spirit. So I bow down to both of you. Thank you. I love you both. Keep doing amazing things. And I can't wait to uh, keep track of you both. Of course. Thank it's you. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You both are so impressive. I was going to cry at least 90 times and I was like, no, pull it together. <laughs> <laughs>